I'd like to welcome everyone once more and thank you for making the time to attending today um, webinar session organized by Crop Health and Protection CAP. Provide you a quick overview of who we are. CAP is one of UK's agri-tech innovation centers. It is funded by Innovate UK and we specialize in driving agri-tech to support sustainable crop production, building networks across government, academia and industry to increase the adoption of innovation. Today, it'll be my pleasure to chair the session. My name is Andrea Stroya and I am CHAPS Innovation Content and Outreach Coordinator. Next up for the program, for today we have a fantastic panel of speakers lined up and they're going to take us through an insightful journey. Opening up the session, we'll have John Matcham today who will be delivering a presentation entitled More or Less. He is the Innovations Director of Light Science Technologies. Next, we'll hear from Charlie Guy, uh, Chief Executive Officer at Lettuce Pro, and he'll be taking us through whether the energy, uh, energy crisis could actually power a renewable future for CA. And last, but certainly not least, we'll be hearing from CHAP's very own Horticultural Research Officer, Oliver Baker, who will be exploring with us the benefits of ETFE. And concluding the session today, we'll have a quick Q&A session to answer all of your burning questions. Some housekeeping slide for everyone. Please use the Q&A function to ask your questions today. And keep in mind that we will be answering them during the panel session. If we don't have time to, we will follow up with you via email. Also, if you require support today, reach out to us via the chat function and someone from our marketing team will get in touch with you. Please note that the session is recorded and we will be sending you a link to watch the session and also to share it with your colleagues who weren't able to attend the session uh, today. And also we'll be posting it on our social media channels, so please do keep an eye on Going ahead, I would like to please introduce uh, our first speaker for today, John Matcham. John has a well-established relationship with CEA from the earliest development of LED technologies and the early part of the millennium, creating some of the very first wavelength-specific light bulbs to control hypocotic land in coriander from one of the UK's largest glasshouse growers to designing and building one of the world's largest vertical farm. John, the virtual stage is now yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'll just share the screen for you and you should see that now. Thank you, John. Andrea, can you see the screen okay? I can confirm, yes. Thank you. Well, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm the Innovation Director of Light Science Technologies. Uh, and uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. We have 10 minutes, there's a lot to go in, and there's uh, a really nice surprise for you at the end. And hopefully this will generate a lot of questions. Uh, my contact details are at the beginning, and at the end, uh, should anyone want to come back afterwards. Uh, our goals at Light Science Technologies uh, are many, but sustainability and uh, accelerating growth uh, with less environmental impact is very important to us. Um, knowledgeable, redefining the industry by working with experts, not just in-house, but we like to team up and work with a lot of people from across industry. And of course, we're incredibly passionate about working together to find uh, lots and lots of solutions. Our patentable smart technology products and services uh, from Light, uh, we cover multiple crops uh, in polytunnel, glasshouse, uh, and really across the board. And we're even now reaching out into open fields for uh, uh, measurement of, of data to find out what plants really want. And that data goes back to our own laboratory, which is based in Derbyshire, where we can pretty much dismantle any plant you like and tell you what it did, where it came from and, and what's in it. And, and we have experts to do that. And the technology uh, is getting bigger uh, in the sense that it gathers much more data, but also smaller. Uh, our sensor grade solution, you can see the image on the right hand side, um, is probably the first uh, sensor in the world that gathers all nine cardinals of data. And in fact, we've gone a little bit further than that. This year, um, with help from uh, uh, Innovate UK, uh, about 150 of those are going out on beta test uh, in the early part of the year. And by the latter part, we'll be looking at subsoil data as well. Measurement standards, are they what we really believe they are? 
and I pulled this picture up because it's used quite often by people like me uh, across the board. And it, this is where we start to challenge and ask the questions of what we understand and what we do and don't know. And this particular graph demonstrates the famous McCree curve. That's the solid black line, uh, the action spectrum for plants. Uh, the pretty rainbow dashed box is what we typically know uh, from academia as 400 to 700 nanometers, uh, and that's um, uh, PAR, photosynthetic active radiation. Uh, and then the dotted line in the middle the, the, uh, goes from 400 to 700, uh, which is a bit of a, uh, an anomaly in here, is what we humans are supposed to see. But then when you go to the line underneath, visible light spectrum is actually listed as 400 to 780. Uh, and that's been quite confusing for a lot of people over the last few years, so I thought I'd shed some light on it for you. We started measuring light uh, using our sensors a while ago now. We will be looking at it quite a, uh, in, in quite a lot of detail. And you'll see there's a set of numbers on the right hand side. L is the latest, and then it all goes down to minus nine. So that's the uh, data that was gathered nine minutes previously. And this is what we'd see normally uh, on a daylight day. Uh, in any particular time of year. And of course, this is changing all the time, not only uh, from the beginning to the end of the day and in the middle, but also minute by minute, as you can see. But that's PAR, and that's what we've been using for the last 100 years or so as a set of standards. We can't see it, we don't have the instruments to measure it, so we'll lose it, exactly what we did uh, many years ago. And you'll see what's interesting in this number between 700 and 800 nanometers, there's still quite a considerable amount of light there. And then above 800, it seems to lower down. It, it reduces as we get higher in the red wavelengths. And you may have heard of this thing called EPAR, uh, which is uh, a lot of been talked about more recently. Let's look at the whole spectrum for a minute. 400 all the way through to 1030 we're currently measuring. Um, and uh, some of this light isn't actually photosynthetic. Uh, and this is where the argument in academia is in some confusion. So I'm hopefully going to clear that up a little bit today. EPAR is now 400 to 750. Personally, I'd like to see EPAR go to 800, but it didn't uh, because it's still reasonably uh, photosynthetic at that point. But this is summed up as what is significantly photosynthetic. So 400 to 750. But as you can see, we're actually looking at what was originally started to call quantum PAR all the way up to 1,030 nanometers. 580 million years of evolution Pond life to land plant 80 million years, uh, and we're just throwing it away. But we're stuck with this word photosynthetic, and perhaps at some point in the future, uh, that word will disappear, and we'll start to look at a more holistic view of how plants perform in light. So just remember that those are the key bits uh, that we realized now in the last 10, 20 years, is around about the 400, we start to look at the ultraviolets, uh, and this 700 to 750 is what's been accepted as our EPAR. So that's just a little bit of information uh, so that everyone understands where that is today, because there is, I know, a lot of confusion. How do we know what we're measuring? Well, we had to go and spend an awful lot of money and build the only machine in the world that measures EPAR, quantum PAR, PAR, and even human vision all at once. So there are no conversions. So we have this based in Dobson and it's there uh, for anybody that wants to come along uh, and get things measured and really understand what's coming out of a a light fitting for going for plants. But in this way, we can make sure that the plants are getting uh, an energy efficient solution of a light that is actually light that's doing something for the plant. You're not buying something um, that is producing burning energy and not actually delivering light that's useful to the plant. So it's very important. Are you getting the most cost effective solution? We've all seen these sorts of images. There's a fabulous picture by Tom Hagen in Holland, uh, and we can see the amount of light that's being fired up into the sky, not only is light pollution, but you have to think about as huge amounts of energy that's being thrown away. And if you're throwing that energy away, it's not really producing anything for your plants. We need to be able to focus it uh, and put it in the right direction. And we've been mapping light for quite some time now so that we understand exactly uh, that you're getting the most cost-effective solution. That is a bit of a quiz for you. You can have a think about this. Um, it's been around this slide now a little while, but I keep putting it up so everyone gets to understand. If you look at uh, picture A on the left hand side, these units will be tested in the same box. It's one of our lights. It's not one well, we're not putting anyone on trial here. And you can see the one uh, on the left. There's some light refracting against the wall. 
of this unit, we can see it's quite a lot. And if you look at the whole shape of the shadows on the wall as they move down towards D, they get less and less and less, so there's less waste. What's interesting is A and B have six lights on each one, C has five, and so does D. And if you look at the yellow pattern that's behind that, you'll see that C produces as much distribution of light as, uh, as A and B, and more than D. So there's a 25% reduction in energy use, or 20% energy reduction use, uh, just looking at mapping. And you'll be surprised that the distance between the plant and the light source itself, in this case, is only 10 centimeters. So light mapping is really important, uh, and we can help you with that. Uh, and designing lights that are, are enabled to work at different heights uh, and uh, suited better for the crop that you're growing will give you a much more energy efficient solution. To create that perfect light, you obviously uh, look at what lights cost you. Lights cost uh, a lot of money. Uh, they're a uh, huge uh, cost in actually building a facility. And typically they'll run for about 50,000 hours and then you throw them in the bin. Um, this is an award-winning product. You can see uh, a picture here on the bottom left-hand side in tomatoes. This was actually at Chaps uh, earlier uh, uh, at the end of last year, uh, where there's some really interesting successful results came out of tomato growing. But our products are designed so that we can pull them apart, service them and keep them going for 25 years. 90% of the core components can be recycled and 85% can be completely reused. So if there's an upgrade, then the improvement in energy efficiency, we can actually take away the bits that are probably the most expensive to put in and keep all the rest and save you lots and lots of money that way. So that's helping keep the lights on and always maintain that you've got the most energy efficient solution within them. Design to make year round growing profitable. It's really important. We've been looking at vertical farms, closed development agriculture for some time, and we're now taking some of that technology outside. And this is where sensor and data information brings together real time environment crop performance, key metrics through our sensor grow technology and digital platform. This enables uh, systems to think ahead. Typically, most of our growing in glass houses is, is, is a reactive response to something that's happening. Not enough water, we add some. In this way, we can actually control systems that enable us to stay ahead of that. So we're not catching up. It's a bit like uh, if you let your house cool down, you've got to burn twice as much fuel to get it back up to temperature. And the same thing goes for growing in plant environments. Keeping ground temperature is really important. Uh, and part of the lighting solution will always be delivering a certain amount of heat, and being able to direct that and get it distributed uh, and monitored accurately enables us to keep plants at peak performance. Here's a really exciting bit for you, because this you won't have seen before. Uh, this has just been patented. Uh, it's an Innovate UK uh, partially funded project with us. Uh, we're actually looking at all year round soil based growing inside polytunnels and glass houses. We're taking some of our high tech from inside vertical farms and putting it outside. Advanced Grow, uh, which as I say is now patented, moves along the crop to provide supplementary lighting and collect actionable data. I'm sure you'll have all heard about DLI, Daily Light Integral. Lots of trials have been done over many, many years as to whether this will and will not work and have to be living some fairly interesting and mixed results. Uh, the picture on the bottom right shows you uh, on the 14th of the 11th, 2022, at 17.32, the light remote is definitely on, but not throughout the whole crop. And you can see by that picture, we've got different levels of light, very difficult to see that there are, are different levels, but there are some with covers, some without, and we've been testing this thing to death. The good news is, uh, during that really cold period we saw a few weeks ago, we were harvesting a summer crop with a miraculously 40% increase even over the, for, uh, the summer um, forecasted figures. And that crop is actually trying to grow again, some of it because we did a quick change around, didn't really burn off the crop because we're trying to save that energy. And we are seeing a bit of that coming through. Um, and the picture on the bottom left hand side was one I took literally last night and dropped into the, into the um, presentation. And that's a crop that's been growing uh, throughout the winter over the last few weeks that's been coming up through and in about six seven days we'll start to harvest that and believe it or not one of the hardest grows uh, crops to grow that needs temperature is rocket and that is exactly what you can see that's actually growing there so we're keeping crops going all year round interestingly speaking to the grower because uh, this is a real life site and a real farm it's not a research facility he's really excited that is actually going to help him grow crops also in the summer and be able to improve 
and speed up his performance of crops. And our target is to produce 18 crops a year where they'd normally only get eight. So it's really quite a significant increase. Uh, and uh, by the end of this year, we'll have those results. Uh, and we're looking forward to publish that the solution works and it's delivering a uh, crop as we expected it to do. In fact, much better. Always trying to do more with less. Thank you very much for this time. And uh, hopefully that's generated a few questions that I can help uh, answer a little later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for your fantastic presentation and for providing us with some insights into the importance of light mapping, where we have been and where the technology is going and the importance of, as you stressed as well, renewable um, lighting sources that do require this upgradable aspect and the cost of it and also their lifespan, I think it's quite crucial going ahead. So thank you very much. Now I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Charlie Guy from Let Us Grow. Charlie's background is in renewable energy consultancy and engineering design. And he's a proponent of technology for good and is passionate about all means of sustainability, whether in food, energy, resource efficiency, or waste realization. Also, Charlie is on the UK Urban Agritech Collective Advisory Board. Quite exciting. Charlie, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, John. Uh, really, really interesting start to today. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for, for joining us. Um, let me just uh, share my screen and then we can, we can kick off. So yeah, today um, I'm going to cover a few things uh, at a, a sort of high level, a little bit about what we do at Let Us Grow and, and how we're helping the industry with um, energy efficiency and, and reducing the energy requirement per sort of kilogram of or, or ton of crop being produced within control of our agriculture. And then a little bit of a, a look at um, the sort of bigger picture around energy usage in horticulture um, and some of the innovations that are, that are going on in the industry to, to help address that. Um, so my background, as I said, is, is renewable energy, and that's what brought me into the industry. I've been working in CEA um, for the last six, uh, six years now um, at Let Us Grow, and we've de been developing a number of different technologies to, to help the industry move forward and, and progress. First and foremost, we're experts in, in aeroponics. Um, so that's the use of uh, growing plants within a, within a fine mist to increase their efficiency increase their ability to um, respire effectively and ultimately get more yield out of out of a crop. We've got a diverse team of uh, over 40 of us here in Bristol um, covering a range of sort of expertise in plant science, engineering, software development and um, yeah, CEA expertise. And we've been delivering projects over the last few years with, with over 15 now delivered around the UK and Europe. Importantly, um, a lot of people will have seen our, our bright pink containers, our drop and grow systems. Um, but I think it's important to, well, you'll see through this, that we've been working across the, the CEA sector from um, sort of the lower tech uh, polytunnel type systems through advanced greenhouses through to vertical farms at the sort of most controlled end of the, of the scale. Just quickly, hopefully this, uh, this comes through okay for everyone. Um, a, a quick introduction to what we do at Let's Grow and what's unique about us. So we've developed a, a unique uh, patented technology um, that enables us to grow plants with sound. I know that sounds a bit obscure, but ultimately um, aeroponics, the technique where you spray root, mit, roots with a fine mist, has always used high pressure systems. We've developed a system that uses ultrasound, which means you can get the, all of the problems related to nozzles in the system out and provide all of the benefits of aeroponics with the simplicity of a hydroponic system and we're working um, with a number of partners through the industry now to scale this up to large scale hectare scale systems for greenhouses and vertical farms why are we doing this um, so the, the fundamentals of, of aeroponics really lie in uh, the ability to reduce the uh, limiting factor of oxygen in the root zone and this is something that we're working with leading uh, experts at, at Wageningen University in the Netherlands to to understand better, but this is this graph sort of shows why that's that's important from the the plant's perspective. We're taking out a limiting factor, which means the plant the roots are happier, and therefore the the plants are happier, and we get more yield out of the out of that system. 
This is one of the trials we um, undertook with uh, Harper Adams earlier, uh, sorry, uh, last year to, to cover this. And, and I guess the, the important thing here is you, you can really see the difference in, in the crops growing. We've got the same system, uh, like the same environment, same system in terms of the nutrient feeds on both systems here. Uh, but within the aeroponics, this is growing a, a baby leaf kale variety. We were seeing 20% yield uplifts uh, across the board uh, through these trials. So moving on to, I hope that's a bit of an introduction to those that, that don't know who we are at Let's Grow and, and gives a bit of a, a view on, on what we're focused on, um, boosting yields in, in, in horticulture in both greenhouse and vertical farming systems. Um, but let's come on to the sort of meaty topic of, of energy, because it's not been the best uh, I guess, start to the year for, for those that are working in uh, high, high intensity, high energy intensity horticulture, which generally I would define as, as vertical farms and um, highly controlled greenhouses that use either heating and or uh, supplemental lighting. The news hasn't been fantastic and I, I think the, you know we've all seen on on shelves recently some of the the outputs of this obviously there's much broader uh, reasons behind food shortages but the energy crisis has definitely impacted on that recently and we've seen a number of vertical farming companies especially either making substantial cuts or um, having to scale back their operations and a number of growers uh, across the greenhouse sector you know, choosing not to plant because of the cost of energy at the moment. So I guess this doesn't paint the rosiest picture, but, you know, I guess some, some fundamentals um, behind this. Energy is obviously a, a key factor for, for anyone working in, in controlled environment agriculture. Ultimately, what we're doing is, you know, we're converting light and other inputs into um, edible crops. Um, but what we see as, as the the real, um, I guess, the, the positives that come out of this is the, the increased adoption of renewable energy systems uh, and decoupling uh, these systems from the grid in some cases to really enable price stability over a much longer period of time. We, it, I guess it's, it's um, becoming more and more common knowledge that some of the cheapest ways to produce energy in the UK are through, firstly, through wind um, and then through solar. And the more that we have renewables on the grid, the more um, it'll improve the some of the that price stability and bring that price down from from the the fossil fuel shocks that we've seen recently, and the the greater potential benefits for the CEA system to to integrate with those renewable energy systems. The headline from this really uh, and some of the work that we've been doing in our uh, environmental analyses on on our products says, and and really reiterates that the type of energy used to power a controlled environment farm is absolutely critical, not just to its economic profile, but to its sustainability profile as well. So this is uh, one, of our, one of our clients, Jason, who operates a facility uh, down in Kent uh, called Rogro. Um, and we've done some life cycle assessment work, life cycle assessments for those that uh, are new to this, basically looks at all of the inputs uh, required to uh, produce something normally. It could be a product, it could be, um, you know, an electrical item, it could be, um, yeah, something, any type of product or, or food product. You look at all of the inputs to that from an environmental perspective, both the capital, uh, physical items, and then the operating items, for example, your energy usage, and you can come out with um, the overall environmental cost, uh, environmental impacts of producing that item. So we've been running analyses with, with some of our partners to, to really understand this, to understand this better, um, and yeah, provide a shine a bit more of a light onto uh, the sustainability profiles of indoor farms, vertical farms specifically, but we're also doing this in greenhouse systems as well now, um, to see where the biggest levers are in terms of environmental benefits. And unsurprisingly, energy and your energy source is one of the biggest. So this, um, this image here really shows that versus the, the average uh, imported produce um, that, the, that we have in the UK for say leafy greens, salads, um, averaged over the whole year, 
if you're producing that in a renewable energy supplied container farm, you can reduce um, that, uh, reduce the, the uh, equivalent CO2 per kilogram by almost three times. The important thing here is that it has to have a renewable energy supply. And this chart shows this uh, in a bit more detail. So this is one of the outputs from, from the study that we, we ran last year with University uh, Brunel uh, and Zemina Schmidt there, effectively looking at uh, the distances that produce travels in, to, to get to our place in the UK. And we've used London as a, as a central hub here. We've looked at distances, types of transport and the energy mix for a facility. And if you look from uh, left to right here, the big circle on here is, is, is how far produce is, is flown in, um, uh, the limiting sort of boundary of how far produce should be flown um, before it's more sustainable to do that, to grow that here in the UK. And what you see is with the, the middle, which is solar powered and, and uh, the right hand image here, which is wind powered, is obviously that distant, the, the environmental profile is highly sensitive to distance. And we're looking at, you know, ways of reducing this through our technology all the time as well. But the main takeaway here is, is that energy mix is absolutely critical to the environmental profile of our produce if it's grown in high-tech horticultural systems. So throughout the industry, um, we're seeing, yeah, some really positive examples of, of, of I guess, cases where um, energy integrations uh, with food production are, are becoming more and more of the norm. Um, we're not saying that this is, uh, these, these projects are able to be, um, you know, replicated everywhere. There's a lot of situational uh, and geographical limits to this, but there's some really good examples out there of businesses that are taking a much more holistic and innovative approach to energy and food production mixed together. So this is uh, a site that's becoming more and more the norm in the Netherlands. Um, this is uh, DES uh, greenhouses, growing tomatoes, aubergines, um, and peppers as well. The, <clears throat> they've got a biomass plant on site which supplies the base load of heat, um, which is then you know, linked into to additional top-up systems. But this combined heat and power system enables them to both export electricity to the grid when they need to, but also be self-sufficient in their own energy usage with a, um, with a sustainable energy feed for the heat. And this is becoming much more the norm, your combined heat and energy systems within uh, greenhouses and vertical farms. Close to home in the UK, um, people like Jones Food Company grow up uh, really focused on, on unlocking vertical farming at scale through energy integration. Um, the, yeah, Jones, for example, seen here, so their first site, um, putting as much solar as possible onto, onto their, their roofs and securing supply through, through solar energy. Grow Up, um, just this last week, launched their, their one pound uh, one pound salad bag product into, into Iceland farms. And the, the reason that they're able to do that um, is due to the, um, the link ups with uh, combined heat and energy systems that they've got on site. So those that are scaling vertical farming are the ones that are able to do it and to lock in their energy supply, whether that's at a large scale or at a smaller scale. One of the projects that, that we've been working on um, over the last, uh, the last year or so is a, a small scale facility down in Kent, which is showing how this can integrate into uh, existing uh, traditional farms. And this is Jason and, and Robro um, down in Kent. And hopefully this uh, video will, uh, will show a little bit more about what they're doing there. It's also really exciting to be part of the next stage in, in development of farming systems and taking system farming practices and the container farm to that fierce pioneering and it's great, it's really exciting.
sort of doing. Don't need special gear at a big scale. You can't do it at a container level. They're just enable Spark to produce great products year round in local communities, which is something which all farms need. We have solar arrays on our building roofs, and those solar arrays we're constantly increasing. And beyond that, Every opportunity we can take on solar energy will be able to take, and on renewables generally, other renewable opportunities will come along. We have. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully uh, people were, were able to um, yeah hear that and uh, yeah to see a little bit of the work that we're doing to integrate directly renewable energy supplies with with vertical farming systems. Um, I just wanted to end on. Uh, uh, a note here around, I guess, how we work as a business, and and yeah, we very much take a collaborative approach um, to um, both the research we do, the R and D into the fundamental sort of plant science, and getting the most out of uh, your greenhouses or or vertical farming facilities with aeroponics, but also to how we are looking to develop the industry, um, partnering with those uh, sort of organisations internationally um, to to really help um, encourage collaboration and, and push things forward. And on the technical side, we've we've got. Um, direct links uh, and working with people at Optimus Energy to ensure renewable supply for our customers, but also um, to look at innovations within the industry that, that we can bring forward um, through, through some of those technical partners. We've got a number of different um, technologies that work behind the scenes to, to power our systems and enable us to optimize and uh, monitor and reduce energy usage as well. And if there's any sort of I guess, uh, system providers, whether, you, whether you're using lighting sensors, um, any other systems, uh, irrigation systems, dosing systems that might, uh, might be integrated into both greenhouses and vertical farms, we're very keen and open to, to talk more about how we might be able to support um, to understand your energy profile, re uh, optimize that and, and therefore reduce that for your, your customers as well. So any, any interest across those board, please do get in touch and yeah very much looking forward to the the q a session afterwards thank you thank you very much charlie for your presentation today and also for stressing on the important points of energy mixing and going forward and paving the way for innovation in this sector and the crucial need for it next up i'd like to introduce our third and our final speaker for today oliver baker from chap Oliver is based at the Wellsbourne campus of Warwick University in the Natural Light Growing Centre, and his focus is on the impact of the broader light spectrum and biostimulants on plant health and produce quality. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Oliver and hand him over the virtual stage. Welcome, Oliver. Hi, thanks for that introduction. Um, hope everyone's enjoyed everything so far. I found it quite interesting. Um, yeah, so I've been working with CHAP for the last uh, two years alongside Ripe, who um, install ETFE in greenhouses. Um, I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, I started in there about two years ago um, uh, when I was doing my master's, um, just picking crops. And over the last two years, I've progressed to doing research for CHAP and project management for Ripe. Um, today, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction about the Natural Light Growing Centre, ETFE, um, and some of the problems around energy efficiency and how ETFE can um, alleviate some of those. So Chap and I have made a video. Um, I hope you guys enjoy it. So what is a natural light growing centre, also known as the NLG? The NLG is a 1200 metre square prototype greenhouse designed completely around the novel cladding material ETFE, ethylene tetrafluoroethylene. Our system enables the full light spectrum into the growing environment, which provides better yields, improved crop quality, and longer produce shelf life. The NLG was completed in November 2019 as a partnership between RIPE and CHAP using a £500,000 Innovate grant that aimed to create this prototype research facility that can investigate and prove the benefits of ETFE on crop production. The facility is set up to be an 1100 square meter growing space that reflects any new high wire greenhouse found across the planet. This provides a commercially 
replicative environment, enabling a direct transfer of our findings from the NLG into commercial use. Our system utilizes a standard hydroponic system using a dripper fed irrigation into grow bags on raised troughs. This is supported with a ground, crop and wall pipe heating system controlled with a Priva greenhouse management software. This goes alongside the latest in biological pest management to grow crops under the same conditions as most commercial growers with the flexibility to tweak our growing environment to reflect the different cropping needs. What is ETFE and how does it help in horticulture? Ethylene tetrafluoroethylene is a melt processable fluorine based plastic designed to have high corrosion resistance and strength over a wide range of temperatures. ETFE was developed by DuPont in 1970s, initially as a lightweight heat resistant film in the aerospace industry and has since then been widely used in chemical, electrical, construction, architectural and automotive industries. ETFE is essentially a plastic polymer related to Teflon and as such has self-cleaning properties which make it ideal for transparent windows which can be created by either inflating two or more layers of film to form cushions or tensioning into a single skin membrane. Weighing approximately 1% the weight of glass, single ply ETFE membranes and ETFA cushions are both extremely lightweight. This in turn enables a reduction of structural framework and imposes significantly less dead load on the supporting structure. This reduces the requirement of, for the steelwork superstructure, providing a big cost benefit in construction and a key benefit when, re when replacing glass in old structures to meet current building codes. As this is compounded by the fact that the lifespan of ETFE is insured for 30 to 50 years currently, but its chemistry actually means it has potentially an unlimited lifespan if looked after correctly. Contrary to this, glass has a lifespan of 15 to 20 years due to water corrosion, embrittlement and cracking from UV exposure. The single ply ETFE greenhouse model has been used for a long time in Japan, where the flexibility of the ETF film enables it to be an ideal building material for earthquake prone environments. As far as the inflated pillows go, these have been used in architecture for quite a while. One of the first examples was the Eden project, later followed by the Allianz Arena in Munich, the Beijing Water Cube for the 2008 Olympics, and Heathrow's Terminal 5, alongside many other building projects. With the UK having an increased focus on food security, the construction of greenhouses becomes quite critical. So far, the UK horticulture industry covers around 1,900 hectares of glass. As of 2017, DEFRA said the, to meet the UK food security demands from greenhouse production, which currently sits at less than 60% of the required volume, an additional 1,500 hectares of greenhouses will need to be constructed. Alongside this, roughly 10% will need to be renewed as they are at the end of their life cycle. Therefore, the construction of ETFE greenhouses can reduce the volume of steel and aluminium required to build the new greenhouses. Alongside this, they will require less upkeep and last longer, therefore reducing the energy use of the controlled environment horticulture sector. Lighting. Lighting in a greenhouse is not a huge energy cost, but is an area in which ETFE excels compared to glass. Single layer, 100 micron thick ETFE lets through roughly 94% visible light and 87% UV light. When compared to 6 mil float glass, which lets through 89% visible light and 61% UV light, there are some clear advantages. This means that you can grow crops without needing additional lighting during the normal growing season. Plants have been growing outside in full, undiluted sunlight for hundreds of millions of years, and their genes have developed to reflect these environmental conditions. Which raises the question, why would you limit your plant's incoming energy? Particularly, as for every 1% extra visible light roughly equates to a 1% increase in yield. Additionally, UV light is integral in many biological pathways that support biotic and abiotic stress resistance, enabling plants in an ETF environment to have a healthy and more resistant this leads on to the minor benefit around nutrition. 
If a plant has all of its light needs being met, then it will be reaching its full photosynthetic capability and will be utilising as much of the nutrition from applied fertilisers as it can. As fertiliser production currently consumes around 1.2% of the global energy demands, any improvement on fertiliser efficacy is critical for reducing the energy usage within the sector. Of ETFE versus glass, where we grow a crop of basil and tomatoes, both grown under the same nutritional recipes, climate controls and crop management procedures. From this, we had an increase in 20% yield in basil, a 47% increase in bricks, which is sugar levels in cucumbers, a 24 to 35% increase in flavanols, a flavor related compounds, and a 9 to 43% increase in chlorophyll, improving the photosynthetic capability of the plant and therefore plant health. This supports the idea that ETFE increases yield, flavor, and plant health over glass. The final challenge in horticulture, and one that has been continuously more challenging over the past few years, is heating costs. As this trend continues, it makes the production costs of growing even more challenging and is forcing a lot of growers to reconsider their place in the horticultural world, with many reducing the length of their growing season or not planting crops at all. Historically, greenhouses are designed buildings on the planet with some of the loosest construction rules for buildings that we work in. The vast number of iterations in greenhouse design are mainly due to the small profit margins of growers and hence the need for the lowest construction costs in modern building. The steel and aluminum found in greenhouses would not be classified as safe for most other buildings in the UK in which humans work in. And in much health and safety law, a greenhouse is considered an outside space. So what does this mean for heating? Well, horticultural glass has a U rating of 5.7 and 100 micron ETFE 5.6. The lower the value, the less heat lost. As such, the heat loss through a single layer of ETFE is very much the same as glass. But the ultra lightweight properties of ETFE allow for a new way of looking at how we build greenhouses. One of the first things we notice is the glazing bars, which hold the ETFE to the roof, can be twice as far apart with ETFE, meaning less superstructure and more light reaching the crop. It is also the lightweight properties of ETFE that allow us to finally consider double glazing in greenhouses. Historically, the weight of glass would mean that to support the extra weight, you would need a lot more superstructure. Additionally, the reduction of light from single layer glass to double layer glass is about 80% visible light and 40% UV light. Whereas with double layers of ETFE, you still get 90% visible light and 80% UV light. So we can now overcome the issue of light through double glazing, and we can overcome the weight issues through the benefits of ETFE as doubling the amount of ETFE has effect on the total weight of the superstructure. As such, RIPE are currently developing a double glazed panel system similar to the prototype you see here. These will be roughly 180 centimeters by 200 centimeter panels that will be created on site in a portable factory that will hopefully produce around one panel per minute and can be slotted into new or existing roof systems. Our cautious estimates in energy saving on heating are around 40%, with real-world testing expect to hit, expecting to hit around 50% in energy savings from heating. Hopefully, this new method of greenhouse construction will offer growers in the UK an alternative to shorter growing seasons or not planting crops at all, and will allow the UK to reach its food security goals. I'd like to welcome back our panel of speakers for today's final session, the Q&A, where we can answer all your burning questions. And I hope most of you can join us for this part as well. For everyone in the audience, if you have not had the chance yet to ask your questions, there's still time, please pop them around in the Q&A section. And now to start off the session, I'd like to first ask John a question. What proportion of wavelengths beyond 700 nanometers would you say is optimal for both supplemental and sole source lighting to maximize the Emerson effect? That's a really good question. 
uh, and it's also very complex to answer, as Jason will know, because I believe he's a professor at York University in plant science. Uh, and it's one I've heard a lot, and it's uh, over the last, uh, certainly the last six or seven months since uh, Professor Bruce Bugby uh, at Utah State came forward with the EPAR. I, I'm not probably the art person to answer that question. I'm the development engineer and really that's a plant scientist uh, to battle that one out. Um, what I can say is certainly since I've been building LEDs and I built one of the very first in the world back in 2006 uh, and we started testing it in 2008. There were literally Edison screw light bulbs on a four foot panel inside a cannabis tent with dimmers on and a spectrometer below to see what we were actually throwing at plants. And the one thing that I think when I said earlier on that we need a more holistic view um, is that Emerson's work was done in 1957 and the technology that was available then and how we produced light is different to how we do today. Uh, and it's about energy efficiencies and looking at these uh, publications in a much, much more different way than we did uh, all those years ago. Um, uh, and I'll use Bruce Bugby again, and we can talk about Eric Runkel at, at NASA and a few others that, are, you know, we've been in contact with it over the years. There are challenges, and what we are learning is that PAR uh, is a specific function within a plant. What we're also realising is, is that the light that we're using now is not just about photosynthesis. It's also about how the plant performs and reacts to different types of light. We can change the flavour of a plant, the colour of a plant, uh, I remember uh, some years ago, there was a really cute gimmick uh, where someone put a mask over a plant and actually put their logo growing in the leaf. I won't mention that company because they didn't actually do it themselves. It was done by somebody else uh, in Scandinavia for them. Um, so I think we're learning an awful lot. This is one of the reasons why we brought SensorGrow into uh, the foreground is that we can then monitor exactly what's going on with light and how plants react to it, rather than looking at very individual things um, uh, 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 in group A and group B in phytochrome and, and so forth. We need to extend that view, but it's a more holistic view of how plants perform. And it's not necessarily about just how quickly it grows, it's what it's doing as it grows, as far as flavour is concerned, its growth, its structure, its morphology. Um, and that's why I'm, I mentioned the, the fact that in rather than looking at quantum par, we're looking at EPAR, uh, and those that have, have, have jumped on uh, and said, okay, let's go for extending it to 750 nanometers, because that's still considered, um, uh, uh, and I think the term that's being used as a, a significantly uh, photosynthetic wavelength. I think the question will go, if we take photosynthesis out of it, although it's got to be there clearly, and we add in all of the other plant responses to light, uh, that will eventually grow, we'll have a much more holistic understanding. Um, I know it's a, it's a challenge, uh, and it's something that uh, that certainly uh, many scientists in academia uh, are concerned about um, because it, it really takes the set of rules and throws them out the window and we've got to start again. Uh, but that's progress, I'm afraid. It's where the world moves. Thank you very much, John. Charlie or Oliver, do you have anything to add as well to the conversation? No, not on that one. Thank you. Then, Charlie, I will uh, come to you with the next question as well. Uh, addressed by Anna, on how can we maximize the profitability of vertical farms and CA as an example, which plants could be used for extra financial benefit? Yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, I guess it's a very situational question. Um, there's obviously some plants that are more profitable than others and some routes to market that are, enable a greater proportion of that margin to be captured by the, the grower or facility owner um, in that instance as well. So. Yeah, I, I think you really, really is quite situational. I mean, what we do with our team um, at Let Us Grow is obviously we work through any any sort of either new businesses or business expansion routes or, or diversification routes for anyone um, within their sort of vertical farming facility. Um, so we can absolutely help with that. Um, so yeah, there's definitely other plants which can be used for extra financial benefit um higher value you know higher value herbs leafy greens and if we're talking in the vertical farming context um but really it's about you know who you're selling those to and and um and yeah the the whole sort of business as a whole needs to be looked at in, in an individual basis so that's why we provide that sort of individual 
uh, advice and, and expertise uh, and yeah be more than happy if, if there's a sort of specific scenario to talk that through with you uh, offline thank you very much charlie and now i'll go around to oliver a uh, question from alice uh, how does etfe cope in windy conditions is there much tearing and also how does etfe compare to polytunnel systems right um so the current way we're designing the roofs is using the panels, um, which use a 3M sticky tape, um, which means that there are no um, there are no sharp points on the panels. And when they're tensioned properly, it's a bit like a drum. So you put a heat gun over the top of it and it shrinks um, and fits the panel very tightly, um, which means there's no sharp edges, which can cause tearing. Um, it's pretty good at not proliferating holes. So say you poked a hole in it with a pen, that size hole shouldn't change. Um, there was a greenhouse that was built out of ETFE in the 80s, um, and we've seen where holes have occurred in that, and the hole will stay there for 30 years, more or less unchanging. Um, we also have a special tape, a bit like cellar tape, that you can put over a hole, and that will patch it more or less permanently. So any wear and tear that does appear like that um, can be quite easily fixed. Um, compared to polytunnels, it wasn't an area that originally RIPE had much involvement in. Um, they were mostly focusing on um, uh, greenhouses because where the cost was, it was too expensive for polytunnels. Um, as we've developed and learned more about it, it now looks like um, polytunnels are a realistic option. Um, and ETFE's long lifespan and uh, lack of light reduction over that time span means that with polytunnels, you replace them every five years with about a 5% loss of yield every year. With ETFE and itself, cleaning capacity means you could have a polytunnel that would last 25 to 50 years. Um, so uh, by not replacing it as frequently, you can actually have an affordable um, polytunnel made of ETFE. Thank you very much, Oliver. Uh, and I've got a question as well for uh, John. Looking at uh, the updating and upgrading side of uh, light, as you mentioned as well, John, it's quite expensive at the moment and the lifespan has been increasing. However, where do you see that evolving in the future? Will we expand it from 25 years to, to 50 to 100? And what else can be done in terms of the upgradability aspect? Yeah, I think um, the reason we went down that route to start creating uh, the product uh, and being able to change it is because LED is changing fairly rapidly uh, as far as its technology is concerned. However, um, manufacturers of LEDs wanted to use up their stocks and, and, and when you're buying LEDs and get them into the marketplace they're, they're not really interested in dealing uh, very much with uh, small quantities and when I say small quantities anything much less than a million LEDs is not a lot of interest to them and that's probably why over the last year or two we've seen a lot of um, LED product coming in to the market for growing which are specifically based on white LEDs and that it just makes them a little bit cheaper uh, it doesn't mean they're energy efficient, uh, which is a bit of a problem. And uh, that, that really is a, is a concern. When you see a lot of product coming in, it's, it's relatively inexpensive by comparison to something that is uh, wavelength specific for plants. And it changes to which plant you want. So I'll give you a really good example. Um, we did some work for a client uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, we ran them for a year uh, growing strawberries. It was quite a bit of press about it. We were not allowed to speak about it on, at the time. And we were seeing exceptionally extended long seasons and they gave to us their specific recipes for us to run in our lab and i said to them and this this comes back to jason's comment earlier on i said to them can we chuck a few in ourselves uh, and they went well no we'd rather you stick to what we're doing and i said well, of course when we're programming up the system in the lab we can see that actually they've got two recipes which are identical and one they've thrown in as placebo um, we said, look, you know, it doesn't fool us. It's your data. We are wasting space in the lab. Let us put one in. So we did. And we had uh, some research of our own that we applied to. And we put in one of these wavelengths way up in red, which everyone said would do nothing. The ir irony behind it was that at the end of the project, it produced vastly more crop and continued growing a much healthier crop. It did things to the crop that nobody liked when they first saw it. Uh, we had a lot of stretch, uh, we had bigger leaves, which we were uh, interesting to see coming out. But actually in doing so, we actually created another answer to a problem is how do you extract the strawberries when you're picking them? 
uh, typically grow quite tightly and quite closely in, 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 uh, to the plant. And in this case, it actually meant the crop fell away from the leaves, the leaves still continue to perform and actually gave greater access. Uh, and that's the product they went with in their vertical farm for growing strawberries. So it comes down to the crop you're growing. The energy efficiency comes not necessarily from buying a cheap LED, uh, but actually uh, going long, uh, longer and further and looking at more detail of the crop you're actually doing. Uh, and actually, we typically find that we can use less energy uh, by targeting the specific crop that's being grown to get a, a specific result. They're not necessarily the results you would expect. And sometimes uh, you can get it. So December last year, 15th, the snow was on the ground here in Lancashire, and I delivered seven kilos of English uh, grown strawberries, British strawberries, not imported, taste just like good summer British strawberries as well, to a TV chef for a charity event here in Melbourne, Derbyshire. Um, you know, here we are in December cutting uh, Swiss chard and growing rocket uh, in a glass house. And, and you, when you sit here and thinking, and, and we're talking about ETF here a minute ago, and I, I have some questions about it because I've got a project that may be interested. Please come back to me afterwards because I've got a project that might be interested in using ETF. And certainly a big polytonal project we're at the moment that I've been trying to persuade uh, to try uh, have a go at ETF. But again, uh, we have a beautiful transparent material in which to let the sun in. I can tell you now that Rocket doesn't like the sun uh, as much as everyone thinks it does. Uh, we discovered purely by accident on a farm, and they've been doing it themselves, it likes a bit of shading. Uh, it doesn't like direct sun. It doesn't like all the UV. Uh, and it actually performs better when it's got a bit of shading on a nice sunny day, which is contrary to what everyone will tell you Rocket wants lots. So I think very much gathering data is really very important and looking at plants individually. We can blanket uh, everything we grow looking at published science. Um, and I research into public science, uh, uh, published science all of the time so that to get a better understanding of where we start, what comes out of that is new steps forward. And they don't always fit what we like to read. Uh, and unfortunately, again, that's progress. Uh, look at that energy, uh, uh, look at the energy usage relative to the plant you're actually growing and the mapping of light and so forth and how you get it all in place uh, to get the best performance from your plant. And it's something that um, uh, the team at Let Us Grow have been doing quite some time now, um, along with others uh, like myself in the industry in developing solutions that actually get better growth. If you'd have said to me 10 years ago, um, uh, using aeroponics was a good solution. Uh, what I was seeing in the world was terrible. It really was terrible. Um, the guys at Let Us Grow, I've got a solution that works. And it's a huge world apart. I had a, a scientist I've been working with at the local university here, uh, said, come and see my aeroponic solution. And I just put my head in my hands um, because it just couldn't grow anything successfully. Today, it's a whole different story. We're changing every time, all the time. Um, there are some great steps going forward. And I, I'd say, talk to any one of us and, and have a proper conversation uh, before you make a decision we're going down an old route because it's easy because the old route won't deliver crops in December um, uh, when it's minus nine outside and all you've got is an eighth of an inch of glass between you and the outside world. Um, there's a whole understanding about all those things coming together, uh, which is just really uh, not something we teach every day, unfortunately, uh, but we are getting there. Thank you very much, John. And I'd like to also offer Charlie now the opportunity to um, express a bit more on how far aeroponics has come through. Yeah, well, um, looks like John set me up quite nicely there. So thank you. And yeah, we've we've definitely come a long way. I mean, from the days of high and low pressure aeroponic systems um, that were pretty much restricted to the lab, you know, we've we've been able to take that out and and scale it up and then develop a system that is actually scalable to the large scale. And we've got uh, we're working with growers around uh, Europe and in the UK to to really bring that to market in the next few years at, at a large scale and, and bring those aeroponic benefits that everyone has known and proven in a lab for, for quite a long time uh, and, and bring that to, to large scale. So yeah, we're, we're, we're mainly focused on the crops that we're um, very good at and that has been um, leafy greens, herbs to date. Um, but we've also, we've got research projects ongoing into much larger crops. Uh, we're looking at propagating trees. Uh, we're looking at uh, propagation across a wide range of fruits, um, both tomatoes, strawberries, all with commercial partners that are seeing the benefits of, of growing aeroponically for, for the plants and for the plant health. So 
yeah, it's it, it's definitely an exciting time for us. Um, we're doing more and more work in in the Netherlands. Um, obviously, the, the uh, well-known hydroponic experts over there uh, in terms of their hydroponic facilities. And as a bit like John said ten years ago, you you often met with well aeroponics. That's yeah, that <laughs> that hasn't worked. Um, but the system that we've developed is 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 very very different and. There's a lot of excitement um, from the work we've been doing with, with Dutch growers about the potential um, of that and the potential to further boost yields. And, and obviously the, the main thing about what we're doing is from, you know, back to the, the, the topic that we're here for today, it's, it's about reducing that um, CO2 equivalent per kilo of produce. That is the, the absolute aim that we're working towards. Is, and then that obviously a, a component of that is, is the energy. Um, a, it's a larger component in a vertical farm due to the, the energy usages there than um, a lower tech greenhouse or polytunnel. But that's what we're all ultimately working towards. And that's where aeroponics enables is, is the plant to be more efficient and uh, the plant to use that light energy more efficiently because it's in a, in a much, uh, I guess, a much more optimum state in, in the root zone. Thank you very much, Charlie. And I also have a follow up question as well regarding um, how widely do people use renewables for CA growing systems in the UK? And also what is the need to encourage, what, what more can be done to encourage growers to set up for renewables? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think the, how widely it's used, I think that that touches on a point of transparency in the industry. Um, I think most people that are using um, I'm going to talk about vertical farms more so, you know, most people using vertical farms are doing so for, for environmental reasons. But, you know, if you're in the middle of a city, for example, an urban growing project, co-locating with an energy source, renewable energy source is pretty much off the table. So you're reliant on renewable tariffs and then you get into the questions of how renewable are renewable tariffs from different vendors. Um, and where's that? Where has each of these electrons actually come from um, that we're pairing our lights with so it is a pretty i'd say it's a something that we're trying to drive the conversation on have more transparency around energy um, sources and energy use within the industry um, we think that's part of our our role as a as a technology provider as a system provider to help bring a shine a light on that a bit more um, but it's, you know, that the thing that I am personally quite excited about is, you know, the more renewables on the grid, the the better the sustainability profile for, for produce grown in, in high-tech horticulture. I mean, that's it's sort of fundamental. There is obviously the the heating question in glass houses, but the the work that the team uh, are doing, the ripe team, is is super exciting on that. And and yeah, anyone that's working on, you know, insulation uh, and and heat management in that in in that field, we are yeah always keen to be partnering with and, and yeah working out how some of our technologies can go hand in hand to to really boost the the total efficiency total productivity of of cea systems thank you charlie john i see you've raised your hand yeah i think um to really add to what Charlie was saying about renewables um in, in getting more renewables on the grid we're also looking at trying to get the renewables off the grid and one of the problems of being on the grid is the grid isn't very clever anywhere in Europe today. Um, post World War II, it, it ended up in a bit of a mess. Uh, we had this beautiful 33 kV network that had the living daylights blown out of it, and, and, and huge uh, projects of building and making machinery came in post war that were very energy hungry. Um, so we're also looking at uh, not only getting stored energy onto farms, uh, but also getting it into the product so that you can get as much energy uh, mm -hmm. at lower energy costs uh, at night uh, and take that energy from those networks uh, where uh, they're not being used as much uh, and the energy cost is lower and then storing it so that farmers can use it during the daytime when energy costs rise. So um, you know, we've, we've, we've got products in the pipeline and literally been having conversations with some universities this morning um, about how we actually go about doing that. And, and it's about being able to use energy efficiently. Um, and you were talking about lifespan of products. Yeah, I don't see why in, in 10, 15 years time, we're not looking at products that go uh, even further. Um, my policy when I'm looking at technology is, is that there's, you can never say you can't do something. Um, 
the only things that really limit us is our imagination and the materials available to achieve what we're trying to do. And if you said to me two years ago, John, I want a battery that's going to last 25 years, I'd have laughed at you. Today, that battery exists. Um, you know, we're looking at uh, Tesla cars now being old fashioned. Uh, their technology is dated very quickly. We're no longer looking at nickel batteries. We're looking at uh, uh, iron oxide batteries and so forth, which are far, far safer. Uh, Americans are always, you know, if you want to test something, blow it up. Uh, we're used to get nail uh, from a nail gun into a Tesla battery. It's going to give you one big bang. Um, if you're using an iron oxide one, it doesn't. It's, a, it's an awful lot safer. They're a little bit more expensive. And if we can talk to farmers about longer term investment rather than just investing in a product today that's disposable in four or five years time over a 20 year period just to give you an idea on a large uh, glasshouse scale you could be looking at 100 tons of material not being buried in the ground or scrapped or whatever uh, from the production of lighting alone and as the materials are always improving and here we are talking about etfe uh, with light transmissions uh, uh, and their physical structural ability with uh, materials like carbon uh, uh, and so forth, we can reduce long-term costs quite dramatically. And those returns come quite quickly. Uh, once you start putting these things into place, you're getting returns within four or five years. And then you're looking at a 20 year uh, uh, view in, in your production and your ability to save on energy and your CapEx costs moving forward. It makes a huge, huge difference. And we, we say we're not a few thousand. If you think about a large greenhouse project with, I don't know, 100 acres of coverage, uh, you're looking at a, a, a cost of installation, even with old technology, well in excess of a million pounds um, to actually put those lights in place. Um, and that's normal for current uh, facilities today. If you're putting something in that's gonna last you 25 years and it's the same cost um, uh, at, at your initial capex, it's a huge saving over a 25 year period. You're saving multiple millions of pounds of investment uh, going forward. And I'd say, come and talk to us because it's here. It's, it's not something of the future. Uh, it's already award winning products. Um, you know, with the guys at Let Us Grow and a chat with the ETFE, these are products that exist uh, now and we're just improving on them as we go forward. But what we wanted to be able to do is to improve them and not make you scrap everything you bought uh, and go back and, and do it again and again and again. And that's why we won the Innovation and Sustainability Award last year, um, because that's what we're doing is, is producing a product that you can keep. Um, the other thing you've got to imagine is, uh, and again, people that are here having this conversation and, and talking about, is that if you're going to invest in that kind of money, Five years from now, if you're using traditional lighting structures and facilities and so forth, you're going to bin them. And then you've got to have all the lorries coming in the chain. Your production stops while it happens. By doing renewable solutions uh, in your facility, it doesn't have to stop. We can send a team along that will do the upgrades and the, and the renewing and the replacements on site. So your production continues working. We can go into a lettuce grow site somewhere on the other side of the world or send a set of kit out that will replace and renew and change over. And you don't have to stop production. It keeps moving. Uh, and, and that's a real key thing. You shut down a 100 acre farm to uh, renew uh, your products that are in there, providing you your light and your heating, et cetera, and so forth. And you grind to a halt for that time while they do it. Uh, and when it can be now done on site uh, and save you fortunes, in fail production because you simply stop working. Um, food production today is about keeping going all year round uh, and don't stop. Thank you, John. I'd like to also uh, ask a question to the panel now for everyone from Raul. Taken together, the best option seems to be to integrate the best LED and aeroponic technologies with NLG type greenhouses to supplement the lack of natural light. How do you see this integration in the future? Mm. And I'd first like to start off with Oliver, and then we go to Charlie and John. Thank you. Um, I mean, yeah, that they, they they do have the potential to supplement each other really nicely and develop a year-round growing system, um, particularly within your standard, more simple greenhouses. We grow when there's light. Um, anything from October through to February, the light levels are so poor that we can't maintain a healthy plant. We can grow plants, 
Um, it's just disease is going to be a really big issue. The heating cost historically has been an issue, but with improvements in design, we can alleviate some of those. Um, so yes, I think together there would create quite a nice platform for year round growing. Um, uh, obviously ETFE doesn't work as well in a vertical farm because you've only got the top layer of plants that will be getting the benefit of it. Um, but yeah, I think theoretically they could work quite nicely um, in tandem. Yeah, I mean, this is this is one of the things that um, I guess chap could, uh, yeah, could be helping with. I think historically in the UK, we've not been quite as good as some of our European partners at putting these types of technologies together and saying what happens when you multiply the benefits of these technologies and and yeah instead of you know 20 percent on each you, you, you're talking about 60 percent or 50 percent or you know it, it's 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 when you start putting these technologies together that you get the compounded benefits and absolutely absolutely like there's, there's adding adding you know light to a etfe greenhouse as i was just said there's, there's benefits for that for extending the season if we can roll our aeroponics in there which should designed to be seamlessly retrofitted into any existing greenhouse structures. So a bit like John was saying, not ripping out things that already been built, extending the life, increasing the capability of that, improving the productivity um, without, you know, whilst using existing infrastructure, maybe we might take the glass out and, and replace that over time with the with the new panels that, that Oliver and the team are producing and, and add some top lighting. I mean, it's, it's all possible. I think the thing that we are less good in the UK is having the, we're getting better at it let's not let's not be too hard on ourselves but having that um large enough combined funding on the sort of public private partnerships that enable projects that you know but we're good at doing individual innovations but bringing those all, all those innovations together isn't something we've been as good at historically as some of our neighbors so yeah anyone that has any influence into that sphere then uh, we'll be uh, looking to you to help lead on this Thank you, Charlie. And um, John? Yeah, and the, 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 that nicely brings together uh, really what we've been talking about. If you look back to the presentation I did earlier, where you see the growing system working in a glass house, that's a 47 year old glass house, which really could do with ETFE panels putting in, uh, because it's, but it was the harshest environment on that particular site where we could uh, test. Um, the guys at Chat. Oliver, and they know we've already been looking at this a while now with them. Uh, and in fact, some of the photographs you saw of the tomato growing in there was done at CHAP uh, as part of a, 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 a test we did on some products. If you look at interlighting, for example, uh, used in tomatoes and um, cucumbers, um, all the main manufacturers of lighting had a go at that. Uh, and a lot of the Dutch growers are now taking out and chucking the bin because it didn't work. And we questioned that. We just went, hang on a minute, that can't be right, surely. Uh, and the guys at chat will tell you it does because we built something specifically to do the job instead of just nailing something together because it was the next quick thing to do and get a product in the market. And then those very same growers that are actually throwing the product out are saying, okay, we're throwing that product out, can we put yours in? Because the results that came out of the chat research that we did with them work well. And part of Sensor Grow was purely to identify how those things would work. Why have the lights all turned on all the time if you don't need it? So if you're using ETFE and you're using an aeroponic solution and you're bringing all that technology together in a modern growing environment, you then need the, the, the systems to actually monitor what mother nature is providing and allowing the technology then to fill in the bits that mother nature's not which means we're using the minimal amount of energy we can need at any one time through any season in the year, anywhere in the world, depending on what Mother Nature is providing in the environment for us. And then we can top up the bits that are missing and keep our plants growing. And that is how controlled environment agriculture works. It is not just about creating a dark space. I know I built one of the biggest in the world. I gave the design up for the biggest one, which will be the biggest by far. Uh, and it's being built here in the UK. And the reality is, is that we need to use nature as much as we can to produce as much of the energy she can provide, uh, the light, the temperature, the humidity, and all the other things we talk about growing the nine cardinals. And we now consider that there are more than nine. Um, we look at things like air pressure and, uh, and other such things. 
uh, which we're adding in, which enable us to control those environments and keep them healthy for plants. Um, and I think all of these technologies come together is absolutely wonderful. Uh, and just keep talking to us because um, uh, the more questions that come forward and, and the more challenges we, we uh, are faced with, the quicker we can produce that technology. Sensor growth gives us the answers and it tells us whether we're achieving it or not, and then how to actually uh, adapt uh, and modify the environment to do the things that we thought plants couldn't do in middle of winter. Thank you very much, John, for summarizing um, your thoughts and also for um, really expressing what the needs are and what ev everything can do together in terms of technologies, in terms of partners and where we have to go next. And unfortunately, I have to say that we have run out of time today. Um, so I'd like to thank our guest speakers very much for their time, for delivering some excellent presentations and for this really insightful panel discussion. I'm sure our audiences have appreciated um, the uh, learnings from this session and we'll make sure to answer the rest of your questions that we didn't have time to address today. And also please uh, keep an eye out on our social media channels. We host regular knowledge transfer events. Uh, SCHAP is an independent not-for-profit organization and CHAP's mission is about build building relationships and networks to accelerate the industry's innovation journey and I hope we've also demonstrated that today. I would like to uh, let everyone know that there is an opportunity to sign up to an open event and tour of CHAP's Natural Light Growing Center and join, join Oliver at the University of Warwick's Wellsborn campus for a tour. You can contact us to register your interest at inquiries at chapsolutions.co.uk. And then lastly, again, CHAP is working with you to secure the future. Uh, I am Andrea Stroya, and so if you have any further questions from today's session um, for our speakers or for chat, please use my email address, andrea.stroya at chapsolutions.co.uk or uh, chat's email address, inquiries at chapsolutions.co.uk. Thank you everyone once more for joining today, uh, and we hope we'll see you in our next section. <laughs>